So there's lots, are there, are there still a lot of entrepreneurs in the room? Uh, well, yes, okay, well, it's, you're at the exciting time. I can see the very early startup phase with just a few, few employees. Uh, well, I'm gonna tell you some stories. Um, hopefully you will not have the experiences I've had or uh, you can avoid having some of the experiences I've had. I give you the forward-looking statement because we are required by the lawyers because we are a public company. Of course, you know the conversation. Actually, sometimes it's a debate on how we're going to feed the world and do it more sustainably. Uh, I borrowed this slide from Omnivore Capital, and I really like this slide. I've added a few uh, things of my own. But uh, we're in the age of the most innovative time to be in agriculture, and I'm uh, getting old. I've been in, in, in agriculture for... Uh, more than 30 years, and so I think this is the most innovative time I've ever seen. And we're talking about innovations from farm to fork, all the way from uh, new seeds, new seed varieties, new traits, to uh, biological inputs, ag biologicals, to uh, big data, precision agriculture, robots, and even novel foods. There is so much opportunity here, and because there have been some successful exits, um, investors are now, of course, moving into this space, as you know. So just give you a little overview of the company, and uh, to put it in context, context, I started the company in June 2000, well, actually April 2006, and we incorporated in June, and we have four commercially available products. We're still uh, small in, in revenue. We've screened uh, 18,000 proprietary uh, microorganisms, uh, and we have a huge pipeline of products uh, coming. Uh, we've built a fermentation manufacturing facility in Michigan, and uh, we went public in uh, 2013. We have a number of, uh, we distribute our products through large agrochemical companies as well as the traditional ag channels. And um, uh, I, I'm putting this slide in here because if you're an entrepreneur, you really better love what you do because you will have lots of ups and downs and good times and bad times and sometimes you'll want to quit. Um, and so I put this in because I, this is a lifelong dream. So I grew up on the most beautiful 40 acres of uh, land in, my mother's still there, she's 88, um, and uh, in southern Connecticut. And it's got a beautiful two acre bass fishing and swimming pond, which they put in uh, from the, uh, dug out the swamp when I was about seven. And my mother still does about a half acre vegetable garden, except it's my responsibility to do the weed control, the pest control, of course. And of course, I can test my products on, on her little, her garden there. But the most important part of this slide is the dogwood tree. So, which is, this is a shot from uh, last year. Um, and uh, I, was uh, one day, um, my, 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 the gypsy moths came through, these are those caterpillars up there, and they came through and were destroying the forests where this land is, but also this dogwood tree was completely covered with these gypsy moths. So my father went to the store and he got uh, carbaryl, which is seven, and it's a, you know, it's a relatively toxic product um, and non-selective. So he sp sprayed it on the tree and all of the gypsy moths went down to the ground and were killed but it also killed the, the bees and the lady beetles and lace wings. So my mother had a fit. She had an absolute fit. So she's uh, screaming at him and she gr drags me out and she says, look what your father did. How can he do this? He's killing all the bees and, the, and, he's, and from that point on, they, she made him go organic. So he went to the, the hardware store and he actually found BT. This was when I was you know, about seven or so. And he found BT in the hardware store, the first ever commercialized biological, and it's still on the market today, and still increasing, especially in Brazil, because the bugs have developed resistance to the chemicals and the uh, traded crops, and so they have back to the, back to the past. So he bought that and he sprayed it, on the, uh, sprayed it on the hemlocks and other trees and the dogwood tree. So I said, Dad, how did, how did, it, how did it go? And he goes, yeah, it's good for the environment, makes your mother happy, but I don't know if it works. And I said, you know, I've, that is the story of my career in taking biologicals from this perception of their snake oils, though they don't work, but yeah, they're good for the environment, to mainstream products. So if you're an entrepreneur, you better have the passion for it. And I'm a little extreme in that I wanted to do this since I was that young. So when you're starting up, it's important to define the basics. And for each company that I founded, 
We started with a very early founding team after I started each company to look, define the mission, the vision, the values, and strategies. And uh, that is because you need to create alignment and filter for the type of people. And that would mean the investors, your board members, and employees that you want in the company. So just to give you an example, uh, here's our mission statement of Marone Bioinnovations, 2006. We discover, develop, and market effective and environmentally responsible natural products that fill unmet needs for pest, weed, pest, and plant disease management. And we slightly modified it in 2012, but not that much. So the mission statement pretty much stays the same. Then uh, we have the vision. <clears throat> and this is something very lofty that uh, you should believe in for 50 years. So we will be the world leader in natural product innovation. And we will make natural, effective, safe, environmentally friendly products the mainstream future of pest management. I really like that. Now we changed and modified that vision in 2014 and said the leader of this biological movement will be launching cutting edge products, will be at the hub of an innovation ecosystem, and because we're now growing and public company, we have to deliver at scale and effectively commercialize research using a defined set of processes called the Marone Method, which is changing from the freewheeling, more chaotic startup to more systematic approaches and will be seen as the voice for the third leg, which I briefly talked about in the panel this morning, um, and, and we will be the source of information and advocacy for biologicals. I like that too. <laughs> so here we are, part of the vision is the third leg, and I talked about it this morning, is that uh, traditionally you have synthetic chemicals, and then the juggernaut of genetically modified crops, which are now on almost a half a billion acres globally, and we see biologicals in our vision as the third leg, being able to stand equally with the, the other two to help uh, crop production and pest management. And part of that vision is that uh, biologicals can meet this challenge of uh, more sustainable production, increasing production, increasing productivity, promoting food quality, minimizing impact, at the same time redu uh, resist managing resistant pests, uh, labor management, residue management, and so forth. And then finally, as I talked about this morning, part of the vision is that over time and much longer term, um, you're, you're transitioning from primarily a chemical intensive agriculture, and the consumer is driving this trend, of course, um, to a more sustainable agriculture. Now, organic is a very fast growing niche. It continues to grow very fast, uh, demanded by the consumer. Uh, but the mainstream farmers are uh, in the middle, the green part, which is the sustainable segment. This is a, they're using less toxic uh, products, incorporating biologicals. For example, the large multi-billion dollar food distributor, Cisco Foods, um, has a, the, their head of sustainability said that if you're a farmer in the United States and you want to sell to Cisco, you must comply with their sustainability rules. And some of those rules have integrated pest management requirements. And the farmer has to tell Cisco how they are meeting the IPM program rules. And they, uh, she told me that the, the number one way that the, uh, the farmers are meeting the, the sustainability rules in IPM, they mention biologicals. So that she didn't know anything about biologicals. She had never heard of them. But because the farmers kept me mentioning them, she started taking notice and uh, now is working very closely with our trade group, the Biopesticide Industry Alliance, um, to raise the awareness of these types of products. So here's the values. And these are probably more important than the other, even the mission and the vision. And here are the original values that we developed in 2007. And we, we have. Um, here, a number of things that um, um, are, that are very, very, not, very, very uh, wonderful to live by, and that is, we are we have sustainable business practices. We encourage entrepreneurial thinking. We're science-based. We use data. We communicate uh, openly and honestly. Um, we have empowered employees. We treat our, our employees fairly. Uh, we involve our employees in things. We believe in diversity. We think a diverse workforce is very important. And of course, you have to have a culture of accountability. And we uh, also believe in, of course, high integrity. 
We then revised these in 2014, and this was done. We had a retreat uh, in Napa Valley with the level one and level two uh, management. And while the level one, the leadership team, was creating alignment among ourselves, the level two was coming up with this new set of values. And they're just, they're sort of a tweak on the ones I, I, we had developed in 20, uh, 27, 2007. But what's important is that as the company grew, we had a lot of new employees. So it was important to involve them and have them believe and have a stake in these particular values. And then they could make each other accountable and also be a filter for when we were interviewing employees um, that they would fit with this, of what we are, we are desiring. Now, these statements are all very, very nice, well and good, but as I will tell you in a few minutes, if a crisis or a serious situation happens, often these values go out the window and self-interest reigns. And so it's really, really hard as a CEO to continue to enforce and maintain these values when there's crises. So then moving on to strategy. So we've developed a strategy from day one, and the strategy remained the same, is the same from in the founding days of 2006 and 7. The strategy has been the same. So that is, in order to develop a product, a company that can get to scale and not just have one sm uh, small product or technology, we need to rapidly develop multiple products in, par in parallel that cross the full range of customer needs. When you go into a distributor in our industry, these big oligopoly in the United States, uh, you know, you have a little company come in with one product and they look at you and they're, you know, I don't want to deal with you because they, they already have uh, their customers of Syngenta, Bayer, BSF, DuPont, Monsanto, Dow, et cetera. And you, you're this little company who they don't know the name of and what do you do? And so it's really important to establish uh, something that they're looking forward to. So the, the reason they continue to do business with us because they know that we're always going to have some new product that is going to meet their customer needs and we're not just a, a, a one-trick pony. So having the, and then we can grow faster um, by having multiple products launched. Uh, we also decided that we would have our own sales force in the United States, but then partner, we are too small to have a global sales force so our, we decided to partner the international markets and the non-core markets, the non-specialty crop markets, the high-value fruits and nuts vegetable markets, but to partner those with other companies. So we uh, had a, have a partnership with Syngenta to distribute one of our uh, biofungicides in Europe, Africa, and Middle East. We have another partnership for that same product uh, with FMC in Latin America, and we have Home and Garden collaboration with uh, Scott's Miracle Grow. So the, uh, some of that partnering. Um, and then as time goes on, we're partnering with some of the more regional distributors. We decided that it was important to control our own manufacturing. We started off with contract manufacturing, but over time we can't get the margins, the profit margins, the gross margins, and uh, the control and the speed that we need. Uh, so we decided, and I did this at my previous company, AgriQuest, as well, where we purchased a manufacturing facility in in Mexico, but I couldn't find one to buy, so we bought an old uh, bankrupt biodiesel facility and retrofit it, put in uh, fermentation tanks uh, in Michigan to control our, our manufacturing capabilities. And the idea here um, in terms of the market strategy was that we're not, our products are not meant to be used alone. They're not necessarily complete displacements for chemicals. So our, our marketing is a soft approach where we're integrating our products into pest management and crop production programs, integrating with the other tools of GM crops and chemicals, as I said. Yes, organic production is important for us because often organic farmers are the early adopters. And it's important to get those early adopters uh, first to get some sales, tell you uh, what they think about your product, and then get into the more mainstream customers. So to put it another way, in graphically, what I just talked about is, is how our strategy looks. And that is our long-term growth strategy, meaning you um, uh, start out uh, uh, in one part of the world and then expand internationally, add more products, add more uses, add more, uh, more customers. And so you have a layered approach. So we think this is a less risky strategy than um, having 
um, all of your eggs in one basket, so you have multiple ways that you can ramp up that growth. So we had decided um, with our venture capital investors after uh, Series A, B, and C of this company that uh, IPO was the best way to, uh, to, to raise more money and for them to get access, exit. So to get to an IPO requires quite a bit of advanced planning. So we started uh, as in, in for the 2013 IPO, we started actually in 2011 and had our first banker, investment banker bank off where the bank bankers came in to uh, pitch for the, for the business. And we had a, a management strategic retreat um, to create a roadmap to 2013 because the company was in no shape to go public in 2011. So we had a roadmap to map out all the steps, break it down, and then execute on those steps to get to the IPO. And then we had another retreat in 2012 to check that, uh, our progress on that roadmap. Now the US government, they don't always do some good things, but, but in this case they did, they did the, the, the Congress did pass a law called the Jobs Act or the Jumpstart Our Business Act, which helped small companies like ours, which means that you could file with the SEC confidentially so you didn't have to hang out all your dirty laundry um, um, or your clean laundry to, to, the, uh, to anybody out there. Um, and so we were able to file confidentially and then get the feedback from the SEC and then continue to get our act together. So that was very helpful um, to be able to do that confidentially. Under the Jobs Act, you're also allowed, allowed to do a test the waters uh, mini road show with marketing to a select group of investors before the real deal. And that was extremely useful to present a set of slides to the potential investors in the IPO and get feedback. And we got um, some very good feedback and amended um, quite a, you know, a bit of the slides for the real roadshow. So then we, uh, in July, we filed publicly and then uh, went uh, public in August of 2013. This was a very happy time. Uh, we had uh, uh, you know, used Jefferies and, and Piper um, as the uh, bankers, the, and uh, we had quite a number of, of meetings, and then we did a, in 2014, we did a follow-on. So, it was wonderful, being able to go there and ring the bell at NASDAQ, and, uh, and my 88-year-old mother to my left, and her sister, um, and uh, it was one of the happiest times of, of my life. But, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> what can go wrong? Well, this is AgriQuest, okay? This is my previous company, okay? So look at the first half of this chart. Oh, this is wonderful. This is every entrepreneur and investor's dream. So we did, I did a, a founding round, then C, series B, C, D, E, and F. So I did, a, did remember this is ag tech. This is not uh, software or social media. So you need a lot of money to get products to the market. We're regulated. It costs millions of dollars um, to get through. And back then, uh, there was nobody investing, very few investing in ag tech. So I had to really work, really work hard, uh, spend, and you still do as CEO, have to spend nearly all of your time raising money. So, but raised 60 million successfully and got to a filing uh, with the SEC for an IPO using Merrill Lynch as the underwriter. We filed for the offering August 3rd, 2001. Well, you know what happened after that, 9-11, yeah? Okay, so um, our valuation at the time we were planning to go public, so I was flying to the World Financial Center to meet Merrill Lynch, which is right across from the World Trade Center, and the lawyers for our deal were in the South Tower. And I was flying to practice the roadshow on September 12th. Of course, that never happened. We, um, all planes were grounded. So uh, we... At the time we were planning the IPO, they gave us a 300 million p potential valuation for the company. This was just at the, the very end of the tech boom, so valuations were really sky high. There was a wide open window for an IPO. Just the event of 9-11, they said if you went out and, went and, and did an offering, your valuation would be about 100 million, okay? So just the, the mere of that event caused the markets to change that, that. I didn't do anything else to the company, but that changed, okay? So now when 9-11 when happened and I said, oh my God, I'm not going to get this offering done, I felt so ridiculously selfish and how trivial this was, my IPO, compared to the fact that so many thousands of lives were lost and the world changed forever. But nevertheless, it certainly changed my world. So 
in order to get my head around it, um, what was I going to do? Because I had just raised you know, six, several rounds of uh, 60 million of capital. The company had gotten large, 75 employees, and we were all ready to, to raise another 60 million. Well, in order to survive, we weren't profitable yet. That meant I was gonna have to raise more money. And I was not really keen about, oh God, another round. And our in investors and board became uh, on the board and they became quite dysfunctional because all of their companies needed money. And so which ones were they gonna prioritize and give money to? And nobody was, no venture capitalists were opening their wallets at this time. So where was I gonna get the money for the next round? So I, I decided before I addressed that, I would go out and get some, a sanity check. And I spent three months globally uh, talking to our customers. And that was the best thing that I could ever have done because getting feedback of what was really important to our from our customers um, kept me sane during that time. So we, um, what happened is that in order to get money in the door, I decided after listening to the customers who said, don't substantially downsize your company because you'll look like another one of those little unstable companies and you're, we're not gonna buy, you're, you know, we're not gonna buy from you because we can just go buy from one of your big competitors. So don't look like you're uh, whacking the company back you know, to nothing and, uh, and you won't be around. So I chose to not substantially downsize. We did lose a lot of employees by attrition, but I didn't substantially downsize um, by maybe, well, maybe only about uh, 20, 15, 20 percent. Um, and so decided then my strategy was gonna be gonna take more money. But what I did, which was a very, very uh, bad error, and don't you ever do it if you're an entrepreneur, and that was to accept a full ratchet anti-dilution on that round of capital. So that was the series G. So what that means is, if the next round after G is at a lower price than the previous round, and all previous rounds, then all of the rounds that are a lower price uh, than that particular uh, round would ratchet down to that price. So, you know, I, the board took the, took the deal. We were uh, valued at $1.38 a share, and the offer from the investors was 6.7 cents a share. So because the 6.7 was below the $1.38, and all of those prices of those rounds were higher than 6.7 cents except the seed round, that meant all of those rounds ratcheted back to 6.7 cents. So the investors all were issued new shares to compensate, and we got crammed down. So that meant we went from uh, 35 million shares to uh, uh, 500 million shares. To, and then of course, me with, sitting with my founder stock got diluted from 5% uh, of the company down to 0.1% of the company. And then, um, then there was, uh, the investors put, kept putting in money at that same price, that really low price, which then diluted me to 0.001%, essentially wiping me out. So that was 11 years of work. So then um, I left um, in, uh, uh, in, in 2006 to start up this company. And then in 2012, um, the company was sold for 425 million and milestone payments, close to, which made it close to a $500 million deal, and I got zero. So, remember the, the picture of the dogwood tree and the gypsy moth caterpillars at my, my, my parents' home in Killingworth, Connecticut? I put that in there because this is a lifelong dream and I wanted to do this since I was seven years old. Something like this would make you wanna quit, but no, I just said, well, I'm gonna start up again and do it again and make up for this. Little did I know. <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> so some, some lessons for you. Always raise money when you, when you don't need it and raise more money than you need. So we always had, um, I know there's venture capitalists in, in the room and you, don't, you always want the entrepreneur to take just enough and so it doesn't dilute you. And the, the thing is you should always take more money than you need because you just never know what will happen, as you can see. Um, and windows open and close. There's, there's, we're in a bubble right now. So, um, you know, funding, actually ag is not quite in a bubble. There was a, a, a bigger bubble in uh, 12 and 13 and 14 and many, many, uh, many, many financings. But it, it's, uh, it, it's a little tougher now since the commodity prices for corn and soybean are very low and, um, 
uh, and, and it's not quite as good, but definitely, if there's a window open, get in there. Um, and don't ever accept a full ratchet anti-dilution. Watch out for multiple um, 4x, 3x liquidation preferences, and you, can, you should plan for disaster. <laughs> but you know what? You can't imagine every possible disaster. I could, of course, no one could have imagined 9-11. Um, and, and it's really important to get a personal lawyer to represent your in interests. I did not have one, and therefore I, 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 did, I was not protected. But here's the other part of the story for this one. So we went public, and the stock price was great. It's doing quite well, um, even, even holding up fairly well after the lockup expires, and there was a lot of uh, VCs who got out and made quite a good, good money. I'm happy for that. Um, but what happened is that um, on, in August of 2014, our COO resigns and we start thinking there's something might be going on and we suspended guidance and our stock dropped in one day by 40%. And then a new employee um, in our commercial division had been out meeting customers and one of the customers brought to our attention a side letter a side deal that had not been declared to the auditors. And we had to open, by law, an accounting investigation, and it's an independent investigation that the audit committee of the board does independently from management to find out what went on. When we announced the um, audit committee investigation, the stock dropped by 80% in one day. I literally wept. <laughs> um, it, 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 uh, uh, you can see the volume of all the sell-off. I watched during the day the stock being sold off millions of shares, and it was horrifying. But again, remember the gypsy moth and the, and the dogwood tree? Why am I in this? I am in this. I'm in this to change the world, and this is my life's passion, so I can bounce back from this. So, what's the lessons? <sighs> Select the people that you have around you very carefully. It's like a, manage, a marriage. Um, managing your board is difficult and time-consuming. So it's really important you can have um, a, a board members who have your back um, during times like this and will be constructive. It's really good to have other found, founders and, uh, and, and uh, those who have been CEOs um, and have some, um, uh, some scars to show it um, on your board. That really helps because if you have only those who have never been through some, some of this, they can be get, get a bit uh, panicky when something like this happens. Um, and it's important to always have a, a, a good lawyer with experience in securities um, who knows how to represent startups uh, with you at all times. I, I'm, not, I'm really surprised I have to say that about lawyers, but you know, I real, I, actually the lawyers have been, really help, have been really helpful during these times. And our current company lawyer is uh, more than a lawyer, he's become my friend and he's uh, worked at both companies. So. Hiring the employees who fit with your desired culture and aligned with your vision and strategy is crucial. It's not always easy, and many CEOs I talk to say we make mistakes all the time. It's just hard to do that. Um, you, ha you have to uh, you know, have that filter with your mission, vision, values, and strategy and find those who, who can um, meet that and fit that and who work beyond their own self-interest um, and who believe in the vision through and through. In the case of biologicals, there are those who get it, and there's those who don't. I truly have had people come in uh, to the company from large companies, and they'd, they'd spend the first six months telling me that our products didn't work as well as chemicals. And I'm like, well, why are you here? And uh, you, you have to believe that these products have a place in agriculture, know they're not perfect, sometimes they don't work as well as chemicals, but when integrated into programs, they can provide the, your customer value uh, better than other types of products, and that's the key. So what I found is that I don't, we, sometimes you're in a rush to hire and get people in the door, and you don't take enough time to vet the candidate. You truly, I truly have to spend a lot more time vetting the candidate and figuring out whether they're going to fit the culture. Too often we're looking for that specific experience that you need in the company, but more importantly than the experience is do they fit the culture. And then if you make a mistake, I take far too long to exit them out of the company. I want to change them. I want to educate them. And, uh, oh, you have to 
you know, I can figure out, you can, you can figure out how to believe in biologicals. No, I, now I have to say, you know, it's just not going to work out and do that quickly. But I don't always follow my own advice. The um, R&D &D can be a minefield because you often hire people right out of school or they just have academic training. And, and R&D people, scientists, and I originally was one, um, and that is that they want to perfect everything and, and, and be, um, keep working on it and working on it and working until something is perfect. Perfect is the enemy of good. You need to have a good product and get it out in the marketplace. And ag can actually benefit from things going on in tech because, you know, when, when someone tells me that, for my R&D that I should do the next iteration and wait another two years before we launch a product, I go, do you, do you really think that uh, Apple is going to wait another two years before they launch this version of the iPhone? I said, you know, they're letting their customers debug it. So they said, oh, that's so risky in ag. I said, no, listen to me. I said, we have a group of friendly farmers who love to be early adopters. We're going to do a test launch with four of those farmers on 500 acres. And it's going to be very controlled, and they're going to tell us what they like and don't like about the product. It's a beta test, OK? It's like you're doing in tech. And, um, and so when we did that with Grandivo, those farmers told us so many things we didn't know about the product. And they told us it worked on that they had a serious problem. It was peaches in Florida, in peaches in Georgia. And they were ready to export. And they had some sucking bugs, that stink bugs that came in and were poking holes in the peaches. And they could not use a chemical because uh, the residues were going to be a problem for the export market. So they said, well, Grand Devo's got the, on the label. I can use it for uh, these bugs, so I'm going to try it. And we're keeping our fingers crossed. Ah. And they, they came back and said, it worked beautifully. We now have a customer for life, OK? In, in, it, it, our R&D wanted us to wait another two years before we perfected it, per, you know, had it perfect. And so we had several iterations. But it's really difficult to find people who are comfortable with that model. And I still struggle with that uh, with many people within the company even today. So it's, as I've learned through my latest situation, is that um, it, the, the maintaining the culture and the values takes constant attention by the CEO. It cannot be delegated. And cultural drift happens a lot, especially if you're traveling a lot as CEO and you're gone and you're leaving lieutenants there. They must be lockstep in line with you in terms of uh, the strategy and the culture. And what I've seen is that it takes years to build the culture that you want, but it can be destroyed just quickly with a crisis in days. And then uh, you have to pick up the pieces. But it is amazing how long it takes to build and how quickly it can be destroyed. So again, it comes back to people. The key is very careful hiring. But how do you really predict how people will react in a crisis? If any of you have a tool or a software or a new something, something, and you know, you're, 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 I know that Google and Netflix and some of these companies do a brilliant job of hiring to, to uh, see if they're going to fit. Well, I need something like that. Um, so if you, you have any advice for me on, on really, truly how I can find the right people who are, who are going to fit and react um, in a crisis, uh, I'd like to hear about it. Because every CEO I talk, talk to um, in this industry has the same issues. So I'll, I'll just talk, finally ending, with um, how, how you're at the early stage. You have five employees, nine employees. That's very different than when you cross 50 employees. That's really a threshold. And then even, even gets even more different uh, when it's 100 employees or above. So the early startup and discovery phase is really fun for, it, for me. And most people peg me as saying, oh, you're just one of those startup entrepreneurs. But not really, because I really really, what really uh, I enjoy more than anything is seeing products adopted in the marketplace. But there is a culture change that happens from a very small startup to, um, keep to when you grow, but you have to keep that innovation and agility going. As you get bigger, it's harder and harder to keep that innovation and agility. So in order to prepare for this uh, transition, we had level one and level two at a two-day retreat in 2014 to develop the roadmap to 2016, how we were going to institutionalize the processes to uh, be able to scale and grow, but keeping the agility and the 
uh, and the innovation. So I was giving a talk to some growers, um, Santa Cruz wine grape growers, um, drinking some very nice wine they were making last week. And a tech entrepreneur, there's a lot of tech entrepreneurs who made money in the tech boom, tech boom one and this tech boom now, who, who like to open up wineries. And uh, so the CEO founder told me something very valuable when I was at this growers me grower meeting and I didn't expect it. And what she said was, there are hunters, usually those are the founding entrepreneurs, and there are citizens. So I'm gonna, she gave me an analogy from the Wild West in, in, the, in the US, back in the uh, old 1800 days, okay? 1800s. So the hunters, those are the cowboys that are off looking and forging ahead, um, looking for uh, 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 what's, what's out there, exploring, they forge new ground, they ward off the threats, um, and uh, they innovate, they adapt, and they move very quickly. Then you have the citizens moving in, they follow, they settle, they develop processes, and often they, they see this, these hunters who are a bit unruly and doing their own thing, and they often handcuff the hunters. And so um, you need both hunters and citizens if you're going to scale, because if you just have one type, it, 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 it can be a bit chaotic. And so I like this um, diagram from the, um, from the CEO of a company called Coupa, which is the art of scaling up, and is what I'm talking about um, and the balance um, that you have to as you scale. You need um, to maintain that agility, but if you have just the hunters, um, you can have chaotic, it can be fr free for all, minimal checks and balances, it can, and that can be hell on earth. But if you have just what the citizens want, and all processes, you end up bureaucracy, and you end up hell on earth. So you need that balance. So I will end with a quote I like from Biz Stone, the co-founder of Twitter and other companies, that opportunity can be manufactured. Yes, you can wait around for the right set of circumstances to fall into place and leap into action, but you also can create those sets of circumstances on your own. Thank you. <laughs>